from different coasts find common ground in their Madison, Georgia garden. Looks like Pacific Northwest meets Charleston. It's a very accessible garden. People come in and they know they're in some place special. The story of the garden and the gardeners next on A Gardener's Diary. I found a garden in the quaint small southern town of Madison, Georgia that is a 20-year-old work in progress by two talented gardeners, Rick Crown and Richard Simpson. They have lovingly restored an 1890s farmhouse and surrounded it with a large garden organized into color-themed rooms connected by beautiful arbors and pathways. I immediately felt at home in their garden. As military brats, Rick and Richard spent their childhood watching their parents create new gardens wherever they moved. So when they decided to put down their roots in Madison, Georgia, they weren't afraid of starting a new garden from scratch. When we were first looking for property to buy, we knew we didn't want to live in the city. We wanted to be out in the country with large acreage and preferably an old house. And we went looking one uh, July 4th weekend and couldn't find anything that we liked. So we thought, well, let's just look in town just to find something to tide us over. And we ended up uh, stumbling onto this piece of property that we liked very much. There was something about it, the property, that really attracted us to it. And we thought we could do something here. Rick, we're here in Madison, Georgia, and it's springtime. And your house typifies the feel of architecture in this area, doesn't it? It does. This was built in 1892. It's a folk Victorian style. And we have painted it the original colors. And the garden has sort of a cottagey feel to it. Right. We've tried to do a sympathetic landscape. It's a not, sympathetic it's landscape. not like historically that. accurate, but it's, it's appropriate to the house, we like to think. The sympathetic allows you to try things like this wonderful exotic fuchsia. Yes, yes. This is a fuchsia coral, and it uh, was developed in Germany, and we find it to be uh, quite a good uh, performer for us in our Georgia heat and humidity. It gets morning sun and, and late afternoon sun. And you've got it here with, it looks like a... A, a dracaena. A dracaena. Which okay. we like to call the friendly yucca. The friendly yucca, <laughs> I like that. It won't, it uh, doesn't have the, the mean spines on it. And we found dracaenas, which are sold as annuals, actually are quite uh, winter hardy as well. Really? Yes. Well, I want to try this fuchsia because of the color of the flowers and even the undersides of the leaves. It is wonderful. Can't say enough good I'm things sold. about it. <laughs> <laughs> but the Dutchman's pipe, though, is the more classic southern plant that you yes. see. And you've got it right here on the front porch. It's very much a southern tradition to um, use a, a good leafy vine to shade the porch. Mm -hmm. And this is one plant that just will cover the whole entire porch. This, this will all be covered as the yes. season progresses. Yes, it makes a wonderful green curtain. It has a wonderful bloom. It's in bloom right now. Yes, you can see why it's called Dutchman's Pipe Vine. It looks like a little meerschaum pipe. The little oh, clay pipes okay. that you see in uh, Rembrandt's. It's and that's Aristolochia durior? Durior, yes. Durior. Uh -huh. It is a host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail. Beautiful blue and black butterfly Ooh. and lays its eggs on it. And uh, so the caterpillars tend to help strip off the bad foliage by eating it up. I've never heard of caterpillars being a maintenance control. Absolutely, and absolutely. You get the benefit of the butterfly. You do, you do indeed. And they are beautiful in the garden. The first year when these caterpillars started munching the leaves, I know many people would immediately reach for an insecticide and say, kill them, kill them. But uh, we watched as they ate the leaves, grew bigger, formed these beautiful golden chrysalises on the porch. And it was a wonderful education, again, of how we're all interconnected. Your garden is nicely divided into different, almost sections, isn't it? It is. We've partitioned it into different rooms and used materials like the native rock. Beautiful. And, and this area we're in started <laughs> off as a vegetable garden but we realized quickly that vegetables require a lot more work than flowers because you've got to plant them, tend them, pick them, and then do something with them. Right. Whereas with flowers, you can just enjoy them where they are. And this orange-yellow, wouldn't you call that orange-yellow flower, yes. really is not a color that you see too often in the no, garden. No, no, and especially in, in spring, it's uh, Cestrum 
Orontiacum, the orange sesame. Or the sestrum. orange sesame. Yes. And I expect it to smell good, but it doesn't really have a doesn't scent. Doesn't have a scent, no. We brought it back from uh, Poes Castle in England. Um, it's a wonderful, unusual plant. The wonderful thing about sestrums, they're in the nightshade family, and right. so they are deer proof. Which we like is, that. We like that. They're we not like going to come and nibble off the flowers. No. And dry stack walls, they're great because if they fall down, you can rebuild them. You don't <laughs> right. have to worry about all the cement. <laughs> That's right. And the dry stack with all of its little cracks and crannies, mm -hmm. um, the little native lizards mm -hmm. love it, and the chipmunks. The chi I like chipmunks. We like chipmunks, Not too. Not many gardeners like chipmunks. No, but uh, it's fun to watch them. Is that a Louisiana iris? That or? is. It That's is. a beautiful copper color. It is. It's probably one of the copper iris progeny. Had you ever thought about putting it together oh, with this yes. care? Oh, you did. Yes. That wasn't an accident. Oh, <laughs> no, Rick. No. That's the Caria. What is it? Japonica, Japonica plena uh -huh. Just picks up. That's a beautiful. Little golden. So that's a Louisiana iris. Is it a name variety or just one of the many? It came from a friend whose sister grows it in Louisiana, so it probably is, but we don't know the name. And then Doing. look at that. Isn't I that have great? To, I jump over from this. Mm -hmm. One Louisiana to this old-fashioned bearded, which would be much more in keeping with your cottage-style right. house. Yes. And of course, you probably don't know the name of it. Nope. Again, it was a pass-along plant. But look how great that looks with it. Mm-hmm. The garden is divided by color areas. It gives room to incorporate new plants as we find them and gives some structure and coherence to what could otherwise just be a cosmic kaleidoscope. A cosmic kaleidoscope. When I toured Rick Crown and Richard Simpson's Madison, Georgia garden, it was obvious that they shared a common vision of what their garden should look like. I found out that their strengths really complement one another, a big plus in their successful garden design business. Rick focuses on plant material, and Richard gives the garden structure. When I wanted to go to college, I decided to go into architecture. Eventually graduated in geography, which Sounds a little funny to go into gardening from that, but it is spatial relationships, and I've used it a lot in, in my gardening and also in my work, which has been in the past uh, 12 or 13 years with Rick. Rich thinks about spaces uh, in a much more organized way than I do and defines them and creates them and then has a plan as to what are the parameters of the plant material that should go in there. I approach from the other angle when I encounter some fabulous plant at a nursery and go, oh my gosh, this is great. Now, where will this fit in? Richard, I get the sense that you're the master designer and Rick is the plant fanatic. Right, I'm the, uh, the little obsessive compulsive one and Rick is, is the wild spirit let loose in the garden. So I've created the structure which he just goes wild and plants wildly in. And the idea of the garden was actually to have these zones sort of spreading out from the house. This first one that we're in is the most intensively gardened. And then beyond that are some garden rooms that are connected by a walkway that would wrap around the house. And then further out, it was more like just a wild woodland garden. And you have these great windows that I'm sure you yeah, thought about. Yeah, we did. When we added onto the house, there were really no great views into the garden, which we had spent about 15 years creating the garden, but couldn't see it from the house. So it was so nice to be able to uh, finally have a way to look into the garden. And in here, we're getting into more of the, uh, the hotter yellows as we get into the front yard. Does having your colors segregated help keep Rick from <laughs> just bringing any old plant into any old area that pretty he feels much, like it? Pretty much, pretty much. You have to have those limits on him. How big is your garden altogether? We've got about 2 thirds of an acre. And you're right in town. Yes, which is perfect. When we bought the property, it was totally wide open to the neighbors. It was a big, grassy area. Now we've um, created more a sense of enclosure with evergreens and with Japanese maples and, and other fun plants. You're a brave soul, black bamboo or, or crazy. any kind of bamboo. I'm a little <laughs> nervous about it. It is a high maintenance plant, but it's worth it. And one of the fun things when you grow a plant that grows as quickly as this does is you're forced to use it in a number of different ways. So <laughs> we have bamboo tripods, we use bamboo plant supports. Uh, you just get creative. You with the recycle your bamboo. Yes. Uh -huh. How tall does this get? This is it's really... gotten, actually, we've gotten some as tall as the uh, black locust next to it, which wow. is probably about 35 to 40 feet tall. 
Bamboo is an amazing plant. It's a wonder it hasn't taken over the planet. It grows with a pointed underground stem that exudes a mild acid, so there's nothing that can totally contain it. On the and other hand... <laughs> on the other hand, you have this exotic-looking creature. Right, which is in the agave family. It looks very much like a yucca. Is this the open stage of the flower? I don't know. This is the first time we've oh, opened it, so, so it's, it may could be. be. This may be it. This is, yeah. Not that that's not... <laughs> That came out wrong. I didn't mean it. I'm afraid, it. yes. As no, one I customer like... said, well, asked us once, is this all that plant does? <laughs> no, I think it's doing quite enough. <laughs> it's just I meant that the flowers were would not open anymore. Into a Some big flowers, showier. Right. Yes. And it looks so wonderful juxtaposed to the Japanese maple. Yes, the Crimson Another Queen. Another color echo. Isn't that good? And that's one of my oldest plants, I guess. Really? Yeah. I got this when I first came down to Georgia. I carried it back up to Knoxville in a pot. Then when I moved down here to work at the nursery, mm -hmm. brought it back down, lived it's in a pot around. for many years. Then it got planted in the garden in three different locations, but it's- It's, it's home set. now. <laughs> it's home. And it's a focal point on your path. It makes a great- Yes, a yes. A great focal point. When Rick Crown and Richard Simpson started to reclaim their Madison, Georgia garden 20 years ago, they had some big battles ahead of them. Besides fighting wisteria that threatened to consume the property, they found the best sun was in the worst location, the driveway. Years and years of driving and parking cars on it created quite a hard pan of gravel and clay, and breaking that up um, was quite a project. I discovered there was a perk to parking farther from the house. Now to get there, you first walk through their beautiful garden and an archway of camellias, a shrub which evokes pleasant memories for Rick. My grandmother, Fletcher Pearson Crown, had a wonderful camellia garden in Decatur, Georgia, and she was instrumental in bringing camellias back in the 20s and 30s uh, up to the Atlanta area. And as a child, I grew up uh, playing in her garden, running down the paths and being around her and being around those interesting plants and beautiful plants made an impression. We're going through the Camellia Arch now, which is actually uh, the rootstock of some white empress camellias that were lining the old driveway. And they were killed in 1982 during the really bad freeze. And they came back, and so we just created that arch out of them. Oh, that's great. So these are original plants, the rootstock of original plants to the home yes. here. Yes, yes, yes indeed. This plant looks so friendly from a distance until you get up close and ouch, it Prickly. gets a reaction, doesn't it? It, it does, it does indeed. It's uh, one of the common names for it is butcher's broom because apparently these prickly little cladodes that look like leaves were used to sweep um, butcher's meat mm. cutting blocks and it would get the bits of leftover meat You know off. a lot of plant lore, right? Yeah, 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 I'm full of it, that's for sure. And it's basically an indestructible plant and it lasts in arrangements forever with no water. Yeah, because nobody wants to touch it. <laughs> but who wants to arrange it is what I want to know. <laughs> Rick and his partner Richard both inherited the gardening gene, which they put to good use in their garden design business, as well as their garden at home. Some of the favorite parts of the garden for me are uh, the white garden. It has a lot of sweet memories too because of the different plants that I've collected from friends' gardens and also little treasures that we have found on trips. It's like a little jewel box for me that I can go to and, and just uh, revel in. This arbor really defines the entrance to the white garden. It does. It really creates that gateway into this other little room. But the, uh, the arbor Rick built uh, two years ago using, again, the local cedar. And that pretty rose. We're growing uh, goldfinch on it which technically is a yellow rose, but which thankfully fades to white. So, so it if it qualifies. didn't fade to white, you'd have to take That's it out. That's right, I'd have to move it to another part of the garden. These beds in the center are a bit more geometric. The garden is shaped in the shape of an octagon. An octagon. So it's an eight-sided garden using boxwood as the background. And then I've lined the beds uh, using brick from the old well surround that uh, was from the house that once stood on this property. This little origeron is, I think, a very useful plant. It's That's a sweetie. A flea bane, I guess they call it. Is. It is, and I think the, the uh, popular name of this variety is, is profusion. And it's 
prolific. It is just loaded with uh, flowers beginning at the end of March for us, but uh, has a very long season, has a pause, and then will just rebloom again. I like that, a pause and then it reblooms. And Dame's Rocket or Hesperus is, is an old fashioned. It's a favorite too, and it's so fragrant. And it comes in lavender, so if any of those errant colors get in here, you just rip them I out. I do. I'm just <laughs> brutal about that, ruthless. And this is charming. Is that liriope? That is a liriope, a silver dragon. It's used a lot in landscapes, but I try to just keep it in small amounts to carry the white theme. So for people thinking about a monochromatic garden, white is really, you're not limited. There's so much color here, so many different variations. That's right. Of white and silver and green. And you really have almost four or five colors you're working with. And this is a wisteria, it or is. as I used to call it, hysteria. Yes, and it is. But uh, what a great way to turn it into a, a almost a sculpture. It is garden. like a living sculpture, and we don't know how long it's been here. So you moved in, and it was here. It was already here, and in fact, it it began here and initially went straight up into the tree, which has slowly been dying back. It's an old oak tree and uh, it's just now resting on the ground as it then goes back up into the tree. And it looks like it does occasionally try to suck her Oh, out. every spring we're beating it back, trying to keep it within bounds. Actually, when we first moved here, half the lot was covered with wisteria. It's well, a constant battle. As I explored Richard Simpson and Rick Crown's garden in downtown Madison, Georgia, I noticed that further away from their vintage farmhouse, the garden became less formal and more of a natural woodland, which featured some rustic outhouses and unusual variations on familiar native plants. This is it, essentially a woodland that we're walking through right now, this part of the garden. Yes, we call it sometimes the dogwood dell because there are so many wonderful mature dogwoods. There's a really neat plant I want you to see over here. Wow. The evergreen Chinese mayapple. That's nothing like the native mayapple. No, it's a... Podophyllum peltatum, so this is... Podophyllum plianthum. <laughs> and the foliage <laughs> lasts all summer long, unlike our native one that goes it's deciduous. It Yeah, right. it's dormant as soon as it warms up. Look at the size of these. These are much bigger than the, the native mayapple. They are. They are. And they have that little serration. Yes and it's a thicker kind of uh, glossy leathery texture not nearly as uh, divided as our native but uh, uh, i think it has a wonderful garden potential rick and richard have another intriguing plant from china in their garden this is one of those plants that people talk about you you're, you're if you're a collector you want to have you've got to have things. it you've got to have, have it and it is a wonderful plant it's sinocalacanthus chinensis the chinese allspice it's not our native sweet shrub, right. but you can see the native in it. It does have that same yeah. aromatic quality, but it has a much larger and more yeah. showy blossom, more almost like a magnolia. It does have that little feel, and the buds are so pretty in the They are. Stage. It's in bloom for probably a little over a month for us. Wow. This exposure, you're getting sun, but there's a good bit of shade later in the day? Yes, yes. As a general rule, one thing I follow is if it's a large leaf plant, it probably wants some shade in the southern garden. That's a good tip for people. A large leaf plant, some shade. Mm -hmm. And it's a good contrast too, the textural contrast with the Japanese maple. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have a color shift there, but the leaf finely shape. cut foliage. So that's one of the ways to create interest in a garden is having that contrast. I learned a lot from Richard and Rick about how to create harmony in the garden, where colors complement each other and the gardeners have their own roles. Theirs is a truly peaceful garden. The garden to me has been a real haven. Whenever I uh, walk into the garden, I just feel a great weight lift off my shoulders. Having that uh, peaceful world to be able to come back home to every day is just a real joy in my life. You get to see your own handiwork and enjoy that and it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't always work out kind of like life but it keeps on growing and changing and I think it's for me a very uh, satisfying and fulfilling uh, aspect of my life to, uh, to keep growing and changing with it. When I visit gardens, I make new friends and discover new plants. Here are some treasures from Rick and Richard's garden. 
Fuchsia Corral is a great choice for a mixed flower bed. It's an excellent container plant and it loves summer heat. Dutchman's Pipe Vine is rarely bothered by insects and diseases. It flowers in late spring with blooms that have an unusual fragrance. Orange Sestrum is attractive to bees, butterflies, and birds. It requires a sheltered sunny site and needs pruning annually. The burgundy flowers of the Chinese Mayapple give way to deep red fruit. It grows two feet tall and has glossy green leaves. The Chinese allspice bush came from Shanghai and is a recent arrival to the United States. It's a hardy deciduous shrub with good fall color. If you want to be inspired, visit someone else's garden. 